From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Brian Bove, a third year PhD candidate in the American Culture Studies program and a graduate assistant in the Center for Women and Gender Equity. I'm guest hosting a special episode today in honor of Women's History Month and the Women of Color Leadership Summit. Thank you to ICS for allowing us to guest host this episode. We appreciate the opportunity for collaboration. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp and the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the homeland of the Wyandotte, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations, present and past, who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties in our efforts toward decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who have been living and working on this land from time immemorial. Today, I am joined by our guest, Lacey Tizano, a featured panelist at the 2022 Women of Color Leadership Summit and founder of Passport Journeys LLC, an app and website that serves to strengthen relationships by providing workshops, events, and teletherapy sessions with licensed clinicians. An experienced technology leader, Lacey has served as the Director of IT and Clinical Applications Manager for the Menninger Clinic in Houston, Texas, and spent three years in Doha, Qatar, leading the digitization of clinical documentation for the entire nation of Qatar, including eight hospitals and 23 clinics. She holds a bachelor's of science in biology and a master's degree in healthcare administration, and has recently left her position at the Menninger Clinic to focus on passport journeys full time. Thank you for joining me today, Lacey. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to have you. To start, could you tell us a little about your business Passport Journeys and take us through the process participants go through? Sure. So Passport Journeys is a new teletherapy app that aims at connecting mother-daughter pairs with licensed clinicians to provide live teletherapy sessions, as well as prescribing activities in between the live therapy sessions for the mother and daughter to have a chance to bond, and also journal prompts. So basically, we are on version two of the app for a new pilot for mother-daughter pairs. Right now, it's a self-guided app. So the mother-daughter pair come to the app. They do the activities on their own. We will have the teletherapy available for mother-daughter pairs to get matched to a licensed clinician based on their questionnaire and how they answer and what they're looking for out of therapy. So I'm excited to add that teletherapy piece. That sounds really cool. And I know because I've known you for many years, that this app started as workshops that you were doing in person. And it was inspired by your own experience and your relationship with your biological mother. Uh, Would you mind telling us about your journey with her and how it led to the idea for the app? And um, what do you hope the app will provide to others? Sure. So the app idea did come out of my own grief from losing my mom a few years ago. So I was adopted at birth. So my mom and I only had 10 years together. And through that journey, we had a lot of ups and downs. But once we got the cancer diagnosis, we knew that we only had nine months left. The oncologist basically said, even with treatment, you've got nine months. So that really nudged us into uh, this intentional bonding mindset where everything we were doing, the clock was ticking. We knew we were running out of time. So she and I drew really close to each other, did a lot of activities to get to know each other on a more intimate level, to reconcile a lot of our issues. And it was beautiful. So when she passed away, I thought, okay, I don't want that journey to be in vain. I want to be able to help other mother-daughter pairs understand that the relationship is too important not to fix it, not to draw closer to each other. So I use that grief to start doing workshops for mother-daughter pairs and facilitated those. I didn't know where that was going to lead, but had those workshops. And then I created a 12-month activity book that was on paper. 
and sold that to just my my network and really helped a lot of mother daughter pairs just start doing activities on their own. And then after that, I decided I wanted to digitize it. So I brought the activity book live into an app version. And um, yeah, that's how it was birthed. That's where it came from, my own relationship. And really just without a cancer diagnosis, wanting mother-daughter pairs to to get intentional with their relationship. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's really beautiful. And I was fortunate enough to meet your mom via Zoom. And she was such a wonderful woman. And I love her. And I see so much of her in you too. Prior to going to college and meeting your birth mother, You were raised in a white family and believed you were white. Could you share a little bit about your shifting understanding of identity and how that shaped you as a young person and later as an entrepreneur? Sure. So growing up in an all white family, all white community is something that still shocks people when I tell them like my background and my story. And so they say, how did you end up in Vider, Texas, which is this small little homogenous town in Southeast Texas. And it's, you know, really has a a pretty uh, controversial history with the KKK and, you know, a lot of those groups that really, you know, projected white supremacy across the town. And so my father, who was a gay white man, uh, owned a bar in Houston, Texas, and he made an arrangement with my mom in Houston to adopt me. And after a few years, he got sick with cancer and I had to move to this town and grew up with this family. Um, And as a mixed child growing up in this all white town, it really shaped my perspective of how much children just want to fit in and how you just want to, you know, kind of fly under the radar. It's a lot about, you know, just acting and being like everyone else. I kind of feel like I, for a long time, put this Uh, disguise on as this white girl. As you said, I thought I was white. My family was trying to protect me in this town and pretty much told me, if anybody asks, you're not black. Well, if you see me and know me, you know that I am. But it was interesting that my family and I were able to keep up this story and that that's what, you know, we used. And it wasn't until I got to college that I really understood my background, that I really started embracing it. And it really shaped my uh, love for Black culture and um, also my empathy for other transracial adoptees who just, you know, get confused and have uh, really hard struggles with identity. So it's been a long journey with um, just my racial background and and everything. Yeah. um, And not to relate it to myself or any other kind of experience, but you know, I've, I've been working on my dissertation and the chapter that I'm writing right now, I was talking about like queer people passing as straight and like the panic of being recognized as queer. And I, I just see some parallels there with like, you know, being in this homogenous town, as you said, and trying to pass as white. And um, yeah, that must have been super difficult for you. And I know that we've talked about it in the past that you didn't realize that you were black or mixed until you went to college. And do you mind like sharing that a little bit? Yeah. And in one comment on, you know, just the parallels here, I don't know if you remember, if you can think back to when you were first coming out and how that feeling was, it wasn't that you had all of a sudden realized that, you know, this was your identity, right? You knew for a long time. And so for me, it's, you know, when I got to college and I had black roommates who were like, you do know you're black, right? I was like, oh, what? Like, oh, I never knew that. Like it was a new discovery, but you know, truth be told, I, of course, you know, for a long time, right? I knew when I was growing up, you know, when I got to college, I was able to actually face it as my own truth, even though it had been true all along, but when my roommates found, when I first met my roommates, um, I had Abercrombie posters on the wall and they came in and they were thinking, who is this white girl that lives in our room, you know, that, that I'm sharing a room with. And I come out of the bathroom and I'm like, Hey guys. And they're like, are these your posters? (laughs) I was like, yeah. They're like, Oh Lord. (laughs) So it was, it was a hilarious first year of college 
having uh, a black roommate, two black sweet mates who were basically trying to teach me about being black. And they, you know, made it their own personal, I guess, assignment to bring me into black culture and the world. And, it, you know, it, it really was my launch pad into self-acceptance. I thank God every day for those roommates. And we're still friends today. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And then, you know, graduating from your undergrad, you moved to South Korea for work. And that is where we met, right? Um, how did you make that decision to, to go there? Very impulsive decision. It was, um, I had just graduated and I had just broken up with my boyfriend. The world was coming to an end. And in the middle of the night, I Googled like the fastest way out of here. I was in Huntsville, Texas, and I wanted to, you know, not just go across the country. I was like, how do I get overseas now? And so I Googled, I found um, private academies where you could teach English in South Korea. Um, and the process was quick. Before I could even realize what I was doing, it was a few weeks later. I'd had an interview. I had all of my things packed up in two suitcases. And I was on my way to South Korea. And it was the best decision ever. Um, that's where I met you. We had an amazing year. It was um it was still one of the best years of my life. I don't, I don't regret it at all. And South Korea was amazing. But speaking of travel, um, <laughs> you obviously you have lived abroad in South Korea in Qatar, and you've acquired a ton of stamps on your passport, and you have taken that idea and used it for your business passport journeys. And I love the idea of you know, people having a passport for a relationship to stamp with different experiences on their journey together. So how has travel influenced you as an individual and in the creation of this app? I'll start with just, you know, the name itself. So Brian, I'm sure you understand because you've traveled a lot as well. The passport, the feeling you get when you go to a new country and you get this fresh stamp and you're you know, in an airport somewhere and you're flipping through your passport, that tangible tracker for where you've been, there's a sense of pride that comes with that. Like, wow, you know, it's, it's showing your travel journey and having something in your hand, it's like a prize, right? For me, I was so proud to have those stamps and to be able to show where I'd been. It gained significance after my mom passed away because the only way that I could find healing was through traveling. So I tried everything else. I was, you know, after she passed away, I moved back to the Middle East and I was try I tried drinking and going out and doing all these things to suppress the pain and the grief. But what I started to do was think about the countries she wanted to visit that were on her bucket list. And I started to visit. So in three months, I, I went to six different countries. You know, she wanted to go to Egypt and see the pyramids. So I was off to Egypt. And that stamp and each stamp after that was a tangible way for me to show my healing process. And that's when I felt like I was really moving through the grief. And that's how the Passport Journeys idea came. I said, you know what? People need a tangible tracker in their lives to show progress. So whenever I created Passport Journeys, I said, I want to make mothers and daughters feel good about this journey, give them new destinations to explore in their relationship and show them their progress so they can be proud. And at the end of the year, because Passport Journeys is meant to be a one year journey uh, where you're committed to your relationship at the end of the year, seeing those stamps, seeing the pictures of the activities you've done with your mom is meant to be, you know, a, a, uh, tangible evidence that you've made it. And that's how I relate it to travel. Yeah. I think a lot of the pleasure of traveling for me comes from that combination of, you know, you're excited to see a new place, to experience a new culture. Um, but then also there's that fear of doing something new, doing something out of your comfort zone. And I think that applies to relationships as well. Like it's good to you, you can derive pleasure from doing like new things, going new places with your partner or, you know, whoever you are building your relationship with. And it doesn't have to break the bank. It doesn't have to be Fiji or Cabo. It could be, you know, going to a park that you haven't been to that's near your house. Um, yeah. So I really, I really like that. We're going to take a quick break. Thank you for listening to Big Ideas Podcast. If 
you are passionate about big ideas, consider sponsoring this program. To have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Hello, and welcome back to the Big Ideas Podcast. Today, we're talking to Lacey Tizano about her journey as an entrepreneur and a leader, how the intersection of race and gender has played a role in that journey, and advice she may have for current and aspiring professionals looking to make a difference. The last several years have been incredibly challenging for everyone, obviously, but especially for women of color in frontline positions. In what ways did COVID change your perception and or your practice of connecting with loved ones or with people in general? So the last two years had an interesting um, culmination of things that happened, right? On top of the pandemic, um, you know, and, and right in the height of it when it was kicking off, we had the George Floyd uprising. And I think the pandemic experience for a woman of color would have been completely different had George Floyd not happened. So I I always think about those things, you know, together to say the pandemic experience was not only awful in terms of the health of nations and what was happening to people during the quarantine, but there was also an uprising that was emotionally traumatizing for people of color. And when I speak from the perspective of a woman of color during the time, there's a few things that were at play. So for me as a technology leader at a hospital that helped mental health patients, going into quarantine only exacerbated mental health needs, right? So people that were already that had already been diagnosed with these disorders, people that were already seeing a therapist, feeling isolated, feeling, you know, so many things. You add on top of it further isolation, but in a way that no one had ever seen before. So career-wise, what we saw were just unprecedented amounts of pain and loneliness and mental health illness just, you know, brought to a whole nother light. And so I think... In that regard, work was very busy. Times were very stressful for a technology team to stand up new technology that we'd never had to before. The same way we're doing this podcast, imagine being a patient who has always seen their therapist in person, but now having to do it over an iPad or, you know, over the phone. So during the pandemic, my career saw um, some heavy challenges that, you know, I was, I was very proud for us to be able to supplement and prop up these clinicians. And then personally going through the pandemic as a woman of color, as a leader, as a wife, as a mom, there were so many things that happened that required me to seek out my own therapist and to, to really try to emotionally heal during a time that was pretty devastating. The weight of this social uprising and what was happening, you know, around the world was so heavy that to do the work and to have a pandemic happen in the background and having all of these, you know, uh, riots and the news was so heavy that it was almost unbearable to carry my everyday like mother task and things like that. So I started seeing a therapist weekly through the iPad, I would lock myself in the closet and just really pour my heart out that it was difficult for me. And I think one of the things that came out of it that I'm so proud of was the hospital gave me the opportunity to create a diversity, equity, and inclusion effort, a program called the Listening Circle. And the whole idea was that there are things that happen in society and your personal life that intersect and that impact your work and your professional life. So for the first time in history, Things that were taboo to talk about at work, we were now able to bring those conversations into work. And and it was very uncomfortable at first, but that listening circle space was for professionals to be able to come once a month on Fridays to talk about issues that concern them around race, gender, ethnicity, identity, and be able to talk about it and be able to talk about it with people that you worked with. And it was it was life changing for me to see the vulnerability and just the camaraderie that came after opening that space. So the pandemic, long answer short, the pandemic changed my life in so many ways, professionally, personally. And I'm actually grateful for the things that I learned and pushed through uh, during that time. It was hard. 
so you worked in both healthcare and education prior to creating the app and your varied experiences have led you to taking an interdisciplinary approach in bringing technology to social and interpersonal challenges with passport journeys. Why and how is this important? Can you describe your approach and the different strengths and trainings that inform it? We are not at a place where therapy is mainstream enough that everyone uh, makes it a priority. So for me, bringing teletherapy to life for mother-daughter pairs, using it to uh, empower relationships and educate mother-daughter pairs on how to have more intentional relationships and healing and growth is very important because I want to normalize getting help. I want to normalize it in a way that mothers and daughters prioritize it, right? They make it urgent. They make it, they budget for it. But what I realized over the last few years is that it is a sacrifice. It's an investment. Therapy for, for everyone is not accepted on insurance plans. Some people don't have, you know, the, you know, are not fortunate to have insurance coverage for it. Some people don't have the, the funds. And so I want to expand access. So at the, so simultaneously while, op while opening in this business, I'm also opening a nonprofit that the mission is to serve mother-daughter pairs with mental health services from underserved communities. So what that's going to do is that's going to prop up the app. We're going to be able to expand access. We're going to be able to educate. And the way we do that is through technology, right? We can expand our reach to rural communities where therapists are not available, where you can log on anywhere, anytime and receive help. So I think there's a lot of great apps and a lot of great services that are doing it now. But the way I've I've brought my education experience and my technology experience and my activism and all of these passions together to say, you know what, to expand access, technology is absolutely required. And to be able to give people more access to these services, you've got to put it on the web. You've got to make it available by phone, by, by computer, by tablet. And so that's what we're doing. And I'm also going to have live events where, where healing and growth are the agenda for mother-daughter pairs. But the, the key is that technology, the key is being able to partner with insurance companies, be able to give mother-daughter pairs these services in a way that they can afford, in a way that they can consume. So you mentioned teletherapy and you've integrated teletherapy into Passport Journeys. Uh, we have seen an increase in teletherapy exponentially during the pandemic. And I think that increase has made people more aware of the lack of mental health providers who are women, or specifically women of color. And it's also highlighted the importance of cultural competence for mental health professionals. Given this, the impacts of COVID on communities of color and other underserved communities, how did you approach collaborating with therapists to best meet people's needs? So it's a great question. It's an early question for where I am. So I am definitely mindful of the gap in providers. I'm mindful of the gap in access. And so while we're designing this app, the phase that I'm in right now is I have just onboarded a clinical advisory board for the app. So what that is are licensed board certified clinicians who are going to provide guidance on how to design this app to be best for all communities. So I have a diverse, well-rounded, all-female clinical advisory board that's going to help and ensure that the app is inclusive, that it can reach those from all different walks of life. And so, you know, what I'm excited about is having this advisory board before I onboard a clinician. So I haven't onboarded my clinical bench or the contractors that are going to be a part of the app yet. But this clinical advisory board is going to allow me to onboard clinicians in a meaningful, intentional way so that we teach them a framework and we give them a theoretical model that's going to be diverse, that's going to ensure that we don't leave anyone out. And so for those, you know, for those mother-daughter pairs that prefer to have an African-American or a Latinx or a diverse, you know, um, clinical team or someone that's going to be servicing them, it can be difficult in other models. But I, you know, from the front end, I am doing the work to ensure that we onboard clinicians that are going to be able to meet that need and be able to meet, um, you know, those preferences. 
So we've talked a lot about mother-daughter relationships and your app was inspired by your relationship with your mother. It's very focused on mother-daughters, um, which does make it very gendered. So are there any plans to make the language more inclusive, like using parent-child, or are there other issues concerning accessibility that came up in the creation of your business or that have been brought to your attention since you've revamped uh, the app earlier this year? It's a great question. And I think one of my strengths is realizing uh, my weaknesses or realizing where I have a gap in knowledge. So one of the reasons that I needed and wanted a clinical advisory board was because I was very clear that I didn't want a tech girl to start this app. I wanted it to be built with professionals that were in the industry. And so one of the LPCs, one of the counselors that I'm bringing onto the app, I was very forward with her. And I said, the reason I want you on the advisory board is because she works with a lot of trans, LGBTQ+. plus. She um, is one of the most inclusive therapists that I know and has the most experience with just different backgrounds and those that you know struggle with identity. I brought her on as an advisor and I told her, I want this to be an inclusive app. And I said, while I'm marketing it as a mother-daughter therapy app, that's very intentional. That's because it, it's my life. It's my experience. I want to push that passion into mother-daughter relationships. But what I also realized from being a transracial adoptee into this, you know, that was adopted by a gay white man, what I understand is that relationships are not black and white and straightforward, right? I'm going to push my leadership team and our, our, our app in general and this company to be inclusive, to be mindful and like you said, to create language when we start marketing, you know, while we say this is a teletherapy app for mother-daughter pairs, what does that mean? What does it look like for you? You know, what type of relationship what do you have? So in what ways do you see yourself expanding passport journeys in the future? I think that um, these first few years, really getting our arms around the teletherapy market and creating events, you know, retreats, picnics, and these live events that bring healing and growth and an online shop that is for thoughtful gifting between mother daughters. Those three components of the business, the teletherapy, the live events, and the online shop are going to be the focus for the next few years. What expansion looks like is into the global market. So by 2028, it's projected that the teletherapy market will be a $135 billion global market. And so what we know is that therapy is not going to slow down and people are not going to want to drive across town to sit on someone's couch. And so expansion for us looks like nailing it in the states, expanding across all 50 states where I have licensed clinicians that are licensed to practice across state lines. That's going to be tough. We're going to have to have a phased approach. I'm going to have to have clinicians that are licensed in several states. So if the mother-daughter pairs are in different states, we can uh, accompany that. Um, so expansion is just going to be a domestic rollout and then into the global market, um, but staying laser focused on the relationship and on ways to promote intentional bonding. For our listeners who are thinking about their own dreams and about forging meaningful connections and or creating a new tool or service to help others, what advice do you have for them? What are some of the first steps they can take to take an idea and turn it into something real? My first piece of advice is to get clarity around your idea. So I talk about noise a lot. I talk about distractions. When you want to move a concept from ideation to execution, you have got to get clear on what your intentions are. You've got to get clear on your objectives. What are you doing this for? Who are you trying to help? You've got to ask yourself a series of questions that just clears away all the noise and allows you to say, okay, my idea or my concept is focused on this thing. So for anyone who's, uh, you know, tinkering with an idea, who's had a concept for a while, sit down with that idea with a fresh mind and ask yourself a few questions to get clear. 
there are so many resources for entrepreneurs to take their ideas and to actually make them happen. Um, and get yourself a mentor, get yourself into, um, you know, small business associations that are in your city, in your town. But before you even reach out to anyone, getting clear on your idea is my biggest piece of advice. What problem are you trying to solve in the world and who are you helping? Then you find people that, you know, are also trying to solve that problem or have before and um, you find your way. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lacey. Listeners can keep up with other ICS happenings by following us on Twitter and Instagram at ICSVGSU and on our Facebook page. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please subscribe and rate us on your preferred platform. You can also find the Center for Women and Gender Equity on Twitter and Instagram at CWGE underscore BGSU and on our Facebook page. Our producers are Chris Cavera and Marco Mendoza, with sound editing by Deanna McKeon and Marco Mendoza. Research assistance was provided by Brian Bove.